Between Awesome and Disaster. This is your host, Will Carey. I appreciate you tuning in as always. Hope you're having a good week. Hope you are getting ready to have a good weekend. We're a couple days out here, and uh, I just hope you're you're well wherever you are. Uh, on the show today, uh, comedian Selena Kopic, who uh, I have known for a little while. I've seen her, as many New York comedians do. We know each other uh uh, from doing shows, but it was uh, it was great to sit down and, and talk with Selena for a, an extended period of time. Learned uh, a lot of talk about craft, a lot of talk about uh, social issues, and it's the kind of conversation that I wish I was having more of because um, trying to talk and dissect big uh, big picture issues, I think on on Facebook, which is what a lot of uh, my friends are do. I often uh I, I i don't have as much of the the time or the our articulateness of intent uh on the internet to have these kinds of uh chats so it was really great that we we covered some of this stuff and just a lot of just kind of earnest hard core like conversation conversation uh is what went on and then i really I really enjoyed this talk and I hope you guys get a lot of it. If you're an aspiring performer or an aspired sen aspiring sensitive person just in the in the everyday pursuit of life, I hope you guys are uh tuned into this. If you enjoyed the show, uh please feel free to share it with a friend. I would really appreciate it. We're on iTunes and Stitcher and you can follow me on Twitter at Comic Will Carry. And uh you should get Selena's album Seen Better Days available on iTunes. Um so thank you guys for listening, and uh, let's go uh, to my chat with uh, Selena Kopic. too long i lit i did this recently i was like i have to sign off like yeah this is not done we're not in agreement but i just gotta go you know yeah i i have my life to live yeah yeah that's why i would rather just like and and all the issues that are are being debated are like kind of big multi multi-layered issues that yeah. have a lot of n nuance or are very clear points and you yeah, have to help understand different sides of the nuance so totally. people can kind of figure out where someone's coming from but that's not happening in like a 87 comment th thread where you're just going for for likes on your comments I and, know. and it's like i i jake flores uh posted recently this great about this great episode of invisibilia about a call out that happened it was um based in the west virginia like hardcore punk scene hmm. this woman was in a band with her like best friend in like the whole world and he got accused of sexual harassment so she had to dump him and then she became this sort of got she started a new band became the sort of like feminist icon mm. of the scene in this yeah. like little microcosm and then but this then random dude was like well you actually cyber bullied a girl in high school so now i'm calling you out yeah and, oh god and yeah. then everyone went, goes after her it never ends and did anybody grow from it yeah oh i know that's the strange thing about the like mob mentality and you know, I'm not totally opposed to it. Like some people mm -hmm. are like, you know, immediately sort of devil's advocate. Like, no, I'm not in, I don't like a pile on no matter what. And I don't know. I do think that there could be room for a pile on, but I think that like a reckoning in theory could come in many ways for everyone. You know what I mean? Like, right. I just, yeah. Like, I mean, everyone probably, I mean, to different degrees, but maybe has done something crummy to someone in their life. And the oh, minute yeah. that you're sort of canonized as this like, pure you know person who yeah, dumps the abuser like well watch out everyone's gonna be scrolling through your old tweets and looking up you know exactly once you're the example of morality there are some people who are like nope there's something off with you i'm gonna find it exactly you know and and maybe it has to do with how willing you are to take that mantle you know like i wonder if she had been like hey cool i appreciate that everyone supports me but like let's just focus on the music you know like i think when people revel yeah. in it too much then th people want to take them down yeah you know? exactly like people want that that sort of like 
like they focused in this in this invisibility episode they focus a lot about like what is the person doing the call out getting like are they interested in that person's mm -hmm. actual growth and and change of an opinion yeah or are they just doing it so they look like the righteous party oh exactly and there's probably uh it, depending on the situation probably bit bit by bit like bill cosby pile on that guy all mm. all day all, yeah. all night yeah the guy is a monster yeah but like there's but then i i remember there was this uh there was this like guy in a band who sort of was like guys i gotta tell you something you know when i would date with a girl once and i tried to kiss her and she said no and i was like oh i'm sorry i'm like dude that's just that ha happens to everybody <laughs> yeah yeah that's I know. you're o that's okay exactly <laughs> that's yeah. okay that doesn't well, make you evil i know i but i mean i do think it's good and interesting and useful that everyone is sort of analyzing their own you know way they they've engaged with people and you know like yeah that 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 rare moment of of reflection that you so rarely i think get in mm -hmm. 21st century uh society where uh full-time jobs or part-time jobs and everyone's hustling to make their thing happen how often do you get to sit and think about how you feel about something and why yeah. or why you think something and why you think that oh exactly oh, i mean thinking about why you think something is so important and i've talked to about I've, I've used that topic to talk to women who sort of blindly say oh, I, I don't like female comedians and I always yeah. say to them I'm like why do you think you don't like female comedians I mean you're allowed to certainly by all means sure. everyone has taste you, everyone has their own specific taste like some people don't like Chinese food I mean that's yeah of course I love like Tina Fey in her book she's like mm -hmm. you know I don't like Chinese food but I don't deny that it exists and some people enjoy <laughs> it you know and I'm like that's such We're a right. good example but yeah, I, I've said that to women before. I've been like, you know, why do you think you don't like female comedians? And, you know, it's always like, oh, they're annoying or too loud. And it's like, okay, well, do you think uh -huh. that's because you were socialized to think that men get to be loud and men get to be opinionated and women should shut up and not talk about sex because it's too much. But when it's coming from a man, then it's okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, I think so. The, sa the same way, like... Um, like talking about like the traditional ideas of what masculinity is in, in current culture, you're socialized to think men are so are uh, act a certain way or are permitted to act a certain way, and any guy that doesn't fall into that, um, in my experience, because uh, I don't think I fit into traditional male archetype, uh, you get called gay a lot. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, and that's one thing that I wish, and I've talked to some of my conservative friends and relatives about this. I wish people understood. The point of feminism is to do away with that also. You know, like, mm -hmm. I think some people think feminism is just about women and just about women not getting doors held open for them, you know? And it's like, yeah. it's it's about how, how um, stifling and uh, just like how stifling and unfair gender roles are that are very rigid and strict for men and women alike, you know? Like, yeah. it's a, a movement to let men be able to cry or do theater or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like drawing cartoons or whatever and for women to be able to you know play basketball and not be called a dyke yeah, like it's both sides of that coin you exactly know? just the idea of like choice um mm -hmm. that's something exactly. that um my feminist fr friends would like tell me uh would would say like you know it's just about choice and i'm uh, like i'm like yeah that makes that makes perfect sense i think and maybe i'm wrong but what seems to be happening at least on the internet nowadays is that uh feminism gets equated with this sort of like anger mm -hmm. with this like with this like level of anger and militancy, then militancy yeah. and, and militancy and then like how it that makes uh, like some insecure guys feel and they can't say that they feel insecure or why they feel insecure so yeah. they just get get angry yeah. like like different ways of like if you're different ways of reacting to like uh, sadness or insecurity if you're like a, an aggressive you, you might react with anger or depression i tend to g lean more to the depressive side turn yes. it inward me too yeah which i also think is sort of a female instinct like just when, I mean, in, in speaking, you know, just this week about the latest school shooting, which who knows, by the time this comes out, maybe there'll be a different one also. But oh, oh, <laughs> my, oh my God. God. Well, well we're, you're talking about the one in Santa Fe, yes. Texas, but yep. a few months before that, there was one that happened like 20 minutes from my dad's house in, in Maryland. Oh my God. Um, so yeah, just, but I'm sorry, finish Oof. your thought. Just that, um, just that, you know, uh, there's been a lot of talk about how like supposedly the shooter, you know, his dad is saying he was a victim and he was bullied and yada, yada, yada. And uh, I mean, I, uh, I, I've, you know, been on Twitter talking about it and whatever. And, like, I, I mean, in high school, I was bullied. Guys smashed my mailbox constantly. Like, yeah. I, w I was very embarrassed all the time. I, like, dreaded school. I mean, I was popular and I had friends. But, like, these guys would really come after me and some of my friends. And 
I really, I, I turned it inside, you know. I yeah. uh, had pretty disordered eating. I worked out militantly. I went running all the time to really angry music, which is sort of how I got into Guns N' Roses. Yeah, yeah. Bl- you know, bless Axel. Uh-huh. Um, I smoked a lot of cigarettes. Like, I was just so... But I would, I mean, I would never dream of lashing out at anyone, you know. And I think for women, that's often how it goes. Or, or mm-hmm. I think for maybe sort of thoughtful people where it's like, I blame myself. I take this on. The yeah. problem's not the world. The problem's me. Yeah, exactly. I, I can definitely, I definitely remember thinking that. I also just remember thinking, what are you getting? Uh, I like, I felt like, you know, I was pretty, I was targeted for, for bullying as well, probably because I'm tall and mm-hmm. that I'm, I'm not quick to anger. So people would try to be tough by mm-hmm. coming after the tall the tall kids so mm-hmm. but same way I just dived into like my my things like in middle school I was I was like I would have terrible stomach aches every morning my mom would have to drive mm. me in because I just my body didn't want to was trying to keep yeah, like me manifest home. physically yeah it, yeah it starts to manifest yeah. its, itself like that and it's just I don't want people to live in a world and like and I think there's a lot of gen of our generation that are are grew up with that and don't want that and especially the younger generation mm-hmm. as, as well and it's manifesting itself like that and a lot of what uh like the woman who got called out said called out and it came back to bite her in the in the ass eventually s- said said it's like if this is the the price so that people aren't afraid to g- go to school or aren't afraid to, for their safety in public then i'm fine with it but i feel there's a there's a messiness to any kind of change like that mm-hmm. that uh there's some kinks to iron out, I think. Yeah, yeah, and and it's so it's so it's so funny, like the bedfellows that you find of like you know I feel like the Republican Party right now is like, well, he was bullied, so he did this. Like she turned him down, and it's like, okay, wow, so you're really leaning into the incel movement, and that like, okay, wh- she uh, this girl who he had a crush on, who he was bothering, owed him something, you know, like yeah, I mean, and oh, and suddenly you give it rat's ass about bullying, really, you know, like you never did before. Exactly. They wow. only they isn't that a touchy feely topic, like. Yeah, you you pull yourself up by your own bo- bootstraps, suck it up, like, unless it's exactly. uh, politically convenient for e- exactly. you. Exactly, exactly. You never talk about mental health on any other time except after there's been a shooting and it affects your career or your bottom line. Yep, and a shooting by a white guy, you know, yes. like, oh, it's all, I mean, it, I just feel like right now it's just such a scary, weird time in our country of, like, yeah. just so much discord so much disagreement, but I do think there's so much like learning going on, you know, as corny as that sounds, like I think people are becoming much more aware of like, you know, uh, privilege, microaggressions, um, you know, systems of power, like, yeah. you know, like everyone. all this stuff has names now where I think a lot of a few bunch of years ago, it, it didn't, it didn't, or it did, but you had to take women's studies courses, you know, like in the middle of a cornfield at a liberal arts college to know it, you know, like, yeah. I mean, and so it wasn't jargon you could throw around, you know, like yeah. I remember learning about like white privilege, at Hamilton, where I went to school, you know, from '98 to '02, uh-huh. and like Ham- where where's Hamilton? It's up. It's in uh, Clinton, New York. It's up near Utica. Uh huh. It's so you're from upstate New York. No, I'm from Boston. Oh, you're from Boston. Yes, I'm from Bo- or suburbs of Boston mm-hmm. uh, originally, but then went to college up at Hamilton, and I uh-huh. loved it. Um, and uh, you know, great like liberal arts, English major, all that jazz. Yeah. yeah. And then lived in Chicago for a year after college. Um, and battled a pretty crippling depression. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh God, that winter there is long. Um, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> woo, and also when you hate yourself. But um, yeah. And then went back to Boston for I was with living back at my parents for a year just to sort of get um, back mm-hmm. on my feet. And then South Boston for three. And then New York since like 06. 06. So so we're looking at twelve years in. Yeah, in New York I can't now. believe it. Oh, oh my God. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, I'm just, I'll be, it'll be eight for me this year. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Moved in June of, of 2010. That's great. Yeah. God. So, um, s- okay. So, so Boston. Yeah. Very, v- I have a very specific thing of, of what that is. So su- suburbs of Boston, what part? Uh, it's a town called Weston. It's right near Wellesley, Waltham. Uh-huh. Um, it's, I mean, it's technically like 12 miles outside the city. So mm-hmm. very close um, it's a very wealthy town. The public schools are great, but some people still send their kids to private school because you know how that goes. Of course. Um, yeah. I went to public school, um, and yeah, a very, but a, a very, pr- very homogenous town. Uh-huh. Um, a lot of kids get brand new sobs when they turn 16, all that stuff. And yeah. the, I, that always irked me, you know, and, um, my, my parents were always like, that's not how we're going to do this. You e- know? Exactly. And the problem with those people is that with, with, a I bet the majority of those kids didn't appreciate that they were getting a new sub. N- oh, no. I mean, a guy in my class who, like, I wish him well, but he 
got a brand new, uh, I forget what it was, but it was like a Jeep or something, crashed it. Then his parents literally gave him an upgrade. I think he got like a probe, crashed it. And then his parents got him a third car that was like even better. And I was like, do you see the lesson you're teaching here? You know, like. You can literally just see like the starting of the failing upwards. Exactly. Yeah. I was right just like, there. Do you, what lesson are you teaching? And I mean, I so appreciated. My parents always said, because I'm one of three girls and they were like, uh -huh. we always got sort of a hand-me-down car from that our mom didn't want. And I, we had to give our dad a thousand dollars to have permission to drive it. Um, mm -hmm. And my dad said, you will never drive a nicer car than your mother. Because that's just embarrassing if the family does that, you know? And, like, yeah. I just think it's important to, yeah, like, the parents should be in charge, and it's their money, and you're lucky to even be here, you know? Yeah, exactly. And then and then once you get out, you can go go and, and have nicer things and work your ass off to get it. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah not everyone gets that. Like, I, I, I was very lucky growing up as far as, like, material things mm -hmm. and, and comfort. And Maryland? Maryland, yes. Yeah. Yeah, small uh, small town in Maryland. Um, but I feel like I – but, you know, I was always making my grades in school, and I wasn't mm -hmm. causing trouble. I didn't drink or, s or smoke anything, I think, until I was 23 and moved to New York. So wow. I was not the kid that everyone was like, oh, where's Will? Will's in his room playing, <laughs> yeah. playing Metal Gear Solid. <laughs> That's where he is. <laughs> That's great. I was pretty easy to find most of the time. Um or like, oh, he's in the basement with his band, because mm -hmm. um, I was I was that kid. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, so, so so yeah. But I feel like I always I was always aware and appreciative of it. So I yeah. I never I don't I I try very hard to beat that sense of entitlement that I think a lot of uh, yeah oh. people get, and and especially when you talk about like m like white privilege, um, it's that that I think is where a lot of it comes from is mm -hmm. that sense of entitlement, that idea of. I deserve this, or yeah. I deserve good things. Exactly. I, I, like I hate to sound like a ha like a like a hack, but like I I like the idea of someone sitting every kid down, and going, "Life doesn't owe you anything." Yeah, totally. <laughs> you can get lucky and get something, or you can work and get something. Exactly. But, and this is not an opinion I would have had at twenty two. That's mm -hmm. when I have a thirty two mm -hmm. after I've been kicked around by life a little bit. Yeah. Oh yeah, because I think that also toughens you up. Like I mean I truly almost pity kids who grow up with no sense of hard work and taking their licks and that this all might like you this might not work out for you and your parents can't always bail you out. You know, like I mean I, I, I often say I'm like I think there's nothing worse you can do for a child than raise them wealthy and have them know that. You know, like, yeah, because I just think it's so toxic to their ability to hustle and work hard. You know, like, yeah, I mean, yeah. my sisters and I joke around that, like, the Copic way is just like work yourself to the bone. Like, I mean, uh -huh. there was three years when I was living in New York where I worked three jobs. I worked full time, nine to five in book publishing, stand up at night, which like, eh, you know, I mean, not a job that necessarily pays. But yeah, but I you got to work at it. Like exactly. Yeah, you got to be out be there job. doing it every night. And yeah. then I was a tour guide on the weekends and I would usually work so often like both days. So I, I would often work seven days a week for years and years and like mm -hmm. I just it's just how I I've always just been somebody who hustles really hard who does a lot of work like I just it's not in my nature to be like I hope I can just coast by you know right yeah and I just I don't really understand it and and yeah I, I don't know whenever if I ever see people or hear about people who like you know their parents pay the rent or whatever I just it's so foreign to me I just don't I don't uh -huh. even it's like wouldn't you want somewhere to go it makes you feel great to be like oh gotta go do a thing you know like yeah ex exactly no yeah i love i love i just love having things <laughs> i just love having things do one the other thing i was i was gonna say about like like the incels i'd never heard that word have you heard mm. uh, have you heard of migtos have you heard that no. mgtow that's What's that? men going their own way it's like the emo version of um MRAs. Oh wow! They're sort of like the sad sack version of <laughs> men's rights activists. <laughs> They've they're they're shunned by women, but they're like, I don't care. I will I will go my own way as a man. And do they uh, give up on sex? But they're not like as um, angry about it. I th <laughs> I think so. Incels mm -hmm. seem to be kind of there's like some resentment about yes. that. Yes. The way I would compare it to if if uh, incels like uh, this is a, a joke I wanted I, I've been I've been toying around with. Uh, not to do bits to you, but, <laughs> but you're a comedian I respect. I know, I'm like, hey, please do. <laughs> but you're a comedian I respect. <laughs> thank so. you, thank you. Um, so, like, if uh, it, comparing it to like music, if you could, con if you could solve incels with a $150 Ibanez guitar and drop D tuning and like the first Stained album, 
<laughs> MGTOs, I think, could be solved with like a Tech and Mini acoustic guitar in the first Dashboard Confessional album. Oh, I was wondering which band you were going to do. Dashboard Confessional. Okay. I yeah. was so into that yes. in high school. Wait, what was the Pete Wentz band? They were a little. Fallout Boy. Well, they were pretty emo, right? Or no? Uh, their early stuff was, I, I would consider, like more like straight up like classic, like 90s, early 2000s pop punk. Oh, okay. Uh, later on, when a more of the electronic and the sam samples came in, I would describe them more as like a pop band. Oh, interesting. But I think their look was emo, so I kind of believed Pete it. Pete Wentz is very emo looking. Yeah. You know, anytime yeah. like the guy liner, yeah, um, yeah, there's, exactly. a certain, there's a certain look to his hoodie. He had his yeah. bass, his bass had a heart with bat wings on it. It's very emo yeah. iconography. Yeah, totally, yeah. Oh man. Whereas I think maybe in the 80s to kind of bring it back to like Guns N' Roses and hair metal, because the reason I'm well versed in that stuff is that VH1 when I was in high school was playing a lot of behind the music of like Motley mm, Crue yeah. and Poison <sighs> yeah. and oh Rat. Yes, and, and that evolution bands. is fascinating, you know, yeah. of going from that era mm -hmm. into GNR and how it shifted, you know. Yeah, like GNR I think is almost like the missing link between what eventually, and GNR, are, I want to describe as remotely sounding like what any of the grunge bands came of, but I definitely think they're the in between before you get to grunge. Exactly, because you can't, you can't go straight from Rat, Poison, Motley Crue to grunge. Like you can't, like you need a stepping stone. And, and because GNR was so sort of, they like they evolved over their career to you know I mean appetite or lies was so in line with that yeah. look and that like the big hair mm -hmm. and then they evolved into you know like and then Axel always wearing like a flannel around his waist and it was like and we give you Eddie Vedder you know like it yeah exactly went perfectly. like when you get into like use your illusion and yes. like you're playing yeah. with like piano stuff and the big videos exactly and yeah. he started was giving that look before like Eddie Vader and yeah. Cobain and uh, like Green River and, Lo and Mother Love Bone, all like all those bands. Yeah, exactly. Soundgarden. Um, it, it's kind of just seamless. It's like the look of grunge with the music of, of me uh, metal. Yeah, of like, and GNR like in this weird sort of bloated evolution, you know, but also Duff is from Seattle originally and he was tight with um, that guy who died really early on in, in his career. Um, I think I know the uh, the guy you're talking about. I can't remember the Rimmer's name, but he was in, I think he was in Mother Love Bone. He, I, I think it was, but his main band was, um, oh God. Um, not Tad, not. No, they were pretty big and they burst out right when their lead singer died of a heroin overdose. And it was, um, oh God, this is gonna kill me. Uh, we're, we're gonna, I'll, I'll, yeah. when, I, when I record <laughs> the outro, if you think of it, Text okay. it to me, and I will record an outro. Be like, by the way, guys, the band we couldn't remember. It yes, was this. yes. So, w were you in? You're into the for so th this music is this like high school for you, middle school? Well, I graduated. It's more middle school because I graduated school. high school in 1998. Um, but I, uh, w when I was in high school, freshman year, my friends and I all dated or like hung out with senior guys. <laughs> Not uh -huh. to brag, pretty cool. <laughs> uh -huh. No wonder everyone in my grade hated me. <laughs> uh, well, the guys. Um, but and they would, you know like play music for us and make us mixtapes. And so I got introduced to like Nine Inch Nails through that. But then also a lot of like Warrant and... Oh, Warrant. Yeah, like some like yeah, some of those ballads it. and stuff, you know? Um, Heaven. Yeah, my Heaven. My favorite... Yes. I read in a guitar magazine... Cherry Pie. Sorry. Cherry Pie. I remember yeah. reading in a magazine that if you, were, if you were a teenager in the 80s, it's pretty likely your first uh, finger bang was to Heaven by Warrant. <laughs> Yes, it probably was. Yeah. Oh, my that God. That guy, have you ever, do you know the author Chuck Klosterman? Oh, yeah, and love. I actually met him once and had him autograph a book. And me, he's, me too. He's, he's such a GNR head. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Um, his book, uh, Fargo Rock City, there's mm -hmm. a chapter where he talks about going to see Jamie Lynn before he, he passed away. And he, at one point, Jamie going, guys, I'm going to play Cherry Pie. I'm going to play Heaven. I'm going to play everything you want to hear. But I have some new stuff I'm really excited about. So if it's okay, I want to play that first. Yeah. And I don't he hated that he <laughs> wrote Cherry Pie at a certain point. He was yeah. really oh, bummed I out bet. on it. Yeah, I mean, I bet, like, I, I mean, I can understand if y you can, like, it, it's sort of like stand-up. I'll have a joke that I think is so funny and so good and I believe in, and it doesn't really hit. And then I'll have a joke that I think is sort of dumb and was a throwaway, and yeah. it goes really well. I'm like, and then sometimes you're like, okay, I guess I got to play this tune forever, you know? Like, yeah, I feel that way. A I feel that way sometimes too. Like, um, and I think you do more clubs than than I do. But like, tr the difference um, of like when you're 
of when you're you're speaking to like your people or people who are like of a sim- similar mentality, and then when going to clubs and kind of having to tap dance a little bit, like yeah, ha-cha, ha-cha, ha-cha. oh exactly, yeah, and doing your ver- your version of humping the stool. Yeah, uh, oh I know, and like sniffing out what's what. Like I remember I played Levity Live. I hosted for Megan um, Hanley, like right after the Trump election, and Ooh. there were some real uh, very drunk real Trump supporters in the audience, and yeah. I never want to alienate anyone. You know, like. I think because uh, I grew up in a house with a very conservative dad and a very liberal mom, like, Mm -hmm. you know, I, uh, and I, I, I'm open to dating conservative guys. Like I'm, I, you know, I'm sort of at peace with it. I'm like, Hey, you do you cool. And, and I just, especially as a host, your job is you're the tour guide for this show. Get it going, get everyone excited. Do not alienate everyone. Set up the feature to do well, set up the headliner to do well, you know? So, I was, but yeah, I, I felt like it was a lot of shucking and jiving that night because I was like, hey, it's all good, whatever. <laughs> oh, God, like, oh, this is <laughs> terrible. Ex- exactly. <laughs> yeah, because you can't go up and like, and like some, uh, some of, I, I guess, uh, maybe our more political peers like on the online, I don't think you can necessarily go out and be a warrior for free speech for Friday night, 8 p.m. show. No, no. And if you want to have a career. <laughs> exactly. And nor do I think you should. I mean, my sister, Laurel, is also a comedian in Los Angeles. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, which is neat. And so is her husband. And we've always said, you know, some people are like, oh, you get into comedy because, like, you're a sad clown. Or, like, some people, because <laughs> like, you want to push a political agenda. And I'm like, no. I got into comedy because I want to be silly. I want to be playful. I want to have just a fun laugh that's pretty dumb. Like, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I like, I don't really have any political jokes because I think, you know, to me, it's similar to like when I was a tour guide or if you're going to a movie. Like, hey, this is you, mom, you know, people in the audience. You probably got a babysitter at home. You came out for a night. You want yeah. to just have fun and you want uh-huh. it to be silly and goof like. I just think it should be a departure and it shouldn't be like, eh, let me inundate you with uh, my patronizing views for why you're dumb. You know, like, right. Oh, I hate that stuff. Yeah. That really, that really bum that, that just bums me out too. Yeah. Cause yeah. Cause again, I'm the same way. Like every time I've tried to be political, like at, at Mike's, it never works. I have nothing funny or different to, s- different yeah. to say about politics. I love the comics who do and, and can make it, make it work like yeah. m- i thought michelle's michelle wolf's performance was amazing so good so, so well done and so good yeah. so well done and crafted in a way where if you complain about it which they are you look like the oh, idiot exactly. I mean, you they don't were, get yeah. the joke they were s- exactly you don't get the joke like and they were so careful like anthony devito and greg stone like everyone who wrote for it dancing to remain like they were so careful to be like we know that afterwards people are going to be combing through trying to look for something anti-woman or about someone's bodies, you know? And yeah. they were so careful about it and it was so well done, you know? Yeah. So, so, so smart. And I, and I love that that exists. I can't do it. Yeah. And so as I've, as I've, I think part of my growth as a, a comic over the last few years has been not to, to really focus in on what I'm good at mm-hmm. and get really good at it. Like yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a tall kind of, uh, I'm like, I'm a tall kind of deadpan dude and I have silly jokes about food and music. I'm kind of just great. Work, yeah. Uh, I want to, I want to do that because that's exactly. going to be enter- entertaining. Yes. And some people. it's what's right for you. You know, I mean, I remember when I started, I started stand up in Boston at the comedy studio in Harvard square, which is so yes. awesome. I like that. I'm getting your biographical details without like, I know slowly uh, but surely. Yeah. W- without like <laughs> hammering. Them I know without being like, here's my resume. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I started there and, you know, I remember people always saying, uh, and I started with, you know, like Joe List and um, Dan Soder and uh, Mike Kaplan. So, so all of those just killers. Yeah. So funny. Oh, I know. So I mean, funny. all and such great dudes, like such yeah. solid guys. Uh, and Aaron Judge and um, Liz Simons was there. Like, it was just a really fun crew. And, uh-huh. uh, and you know, they would always, everyone would always talk about, like, finding your voice, finding your voice. And, you yeah. know, when I was young, I was sort of like, oh, okay, I, I don't quite know what that means, but I'll just stay on this pathway. And, you know, it took moving to New York where I was getting up all the time that I was like, oh, this is ha-, like in Boston. I was the scene was so different then. I mean, it was like, oh, five. Like, so uh, there yeah. wasn't really what was comedy in Boston like in oh, five. I'm, I'm really curious, like what the what's like the tone of the, the city or where, where the rooms because my I- idea of Boston is there are a lot of well attended shows very few open mics and mm-hmm. it's kind of hard to get into if you're in now the towner yes yeah uh, ding 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 yeah it was <laughs> especially back then i mean back then there was literally an open mic that oh, was wow. on mondays and that was it you know i mean uh, 
there was not much at all. And then you had the comedy studio in Harvard Square, which is so great. Yeah, I've heard um, great things about that oh, place. It's such a great room. I mean, they're actually moving to a new space right now, but uh, and I'm sure the new space will be awesome. But uh -huh. the old space was in the third floor of this of the Hong Kong. Yes, this, above uh, the Chinese food restaurant. Yeah, Chinese yeah. food restaurant slash dance club. I mean, this is so ridiculous. <laughs> Across the street from Harvard. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and it's just like go up this flight of stairs, keep going that flight of stairs, and then you're in this like magical like attic. Uh -huh. That was just tight room, kind of low ceiling, um, for scorpion bowls that everyone would be drinking. Yeah, and like, yeah. And they pack them in. The staff is wonderful. Rick Jenkins is a gem. He would tape every set. So, I mean, I was brand new, and he was taping every single set and then give it to you as a DVD right after. Like, it's, uh -huh. it's such a great breeding ground to, like, see how you look on stage. And, you know, I mean, it was great boot camp. But, um, and then smart audiences, um, uh, so you have stuff like that because that's Cambridge, you know? Yeah, but you have that. Yeah, because Boston, there's that like dichotomy of like the, the college town and the really learned people. And then there's the, the sort of working like class Boston. <laughs> like, <laughs> the guys that I, l I, I just love, like I, I have a, like, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I'm sorry to interject, oh, but uh, a bunch of years ago, uh, my, my j friend Janice and I went and saw the Dropkick Murphys oh, yeah. in Connecticut. Nice. And a guy, like, I don't know if he had a heart attack or he, like, passed out. He fell pretty <gasps> abruptly in the front row, yeah. and they stopped the show. Mm -hmm. Like, we were up at the top, and they brought in EMTs and stuff, and, like, wow. the, the, they were, the lead singer was handling it pretty well. Yeah. And some douchebag tries to like s start a fight with some guy in the round and the guy goes and the lead singer of dropkick goes hey guys don't be retarded yeah, yeah. and oh my God. i know it's not cool to say that word <laughs> anymore but i i just cannot help but laugh hearing certain oh. not okay words in a boston oh i know working exactly. class Oh, Go exactly. Bruins I know, accent. I know, I know. There's certain words in a Boston accent where I'm just like, yes, oh my God. <laughs> oh, like there's a joke. Um, oh God, I think it's Taylor. Oh, fuck, I'm going to forget his last name, but sweet comedian from Boston. Um, it's not Taylor Taylor Williamson, is it? No. Um no, it was Taylor. It was some guy from Boston. I'm so terrible, but he—it's so great for a Boston accent. They, uh -huh. You know, they go. Uh, somebody said to him, "They're like, oh, you're from Boston. Do you pocky can have it yad?" And he goes, "No, I don't, but I do murder strangers." <laughs> Oh, that is I know. so good. I know it's so good. I believe it. Uh, I'll have to look that up too. But I mean, also just like perfect words, murder strangers. You know, like yeah. oh, I got the words are so great. But but yeah, that's the funny thing about Boston is that like duality of you know it's very academic, it's very collegiate, it has so many goddamn colleges. Yeah. Um, but then also you know also a real kind of towny type of town. Um, you know, with, uh, and I love a Boston accent so much. And I, when I, so I started at the comedy studio, but then, God bless his heart, um, this sweet guy whose name also, uh, oh God, I feel like lately me and names, but uh, I started, uh, this guy would book me, he would book um, comedy shows at VFW halls in Western yep. Massachusetts. Oh, yeah, I've done, I did a bunch of those in yeah, Baltimore. Oh yeah, oh my God, it's a great place to just get your teeth kicked in, you know, like, Absolutely. oh my God, I would go, you know, I'd drive out to Western Mass and I would do, you know, 25 minutes at these VFW halls and sometimes it would go well and sometimes, uh -huh. hoo hoo, they hated me. Like, yeah. I remember getting off stage once. Um, and How many years in are you at this point? I'm, st oh, I'm still, well, uh, let's see, because I was in Boston for two years doing stand-up, mm -hmm. but I was only getting up like once a month, and I was like, "This is doing comedy, I guess," you know, like or uh -huh. e even if once a month, like. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so then, uh, so that uh, I moved to New York in '06, and then I still like I remember my first like six or eight months in New York. I just sort of got settled and got a job, and like didn't even do. I think I did like one bringer at Stand Up New York, like. Yeah, yeah. So. When I think back, I'm like, I feel like it, it wasn't until maybe like 08 when I started running my own weekly show on Avenue B. Mm -hmm. um, it was probably 08, 09 when I finally like buckled in and under got it, you know. But yeah. But when I was doing these VFW Hall featuring, I was I, I was living in New York, so that's even the sadder thing because I would literally go from New York to Boston, go to my uh -huh. parents' house, pick up the car, drive out to Western Mass to do 25 minutes for a bunch of people who fucking hated me. Uh -huh. um, but I was probably at that point, like a few years in, like I, c I could do 25 minutes, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. But it was like my first time doing 25 minutes. Yeah. I remember that like my first couple of years in, it was, I was doing these like 20, like doing 20 minute sets, but I had like maybe 21 minutes mm -hmm. if I, if I did well. Um, and then if yeah. I asked a headliner, they'd tell me I had 10. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. I mean, I definitely was like, I, I remember one time like burning through material cause it wasn't going well and I didn't have much else to lean on, you know? 
Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. That happened to me a couple years ago in Istanbul. Wow. I was I was doing a I was doing a show. I was opening for this other guy who's also six foot seven, so it was a really tall show. <laughs> and uh the show was sold out. There's like sixty something people and it was like May Day in Istanbul, so there had been like police actions and rioting and wow. protesting all day. It was and like like blood on the sidewalk. It was pretty intense. And I they kind of knew English. I was under impression that maybe they'd know a bit more English. Oh gosh. So I tanked <laughs> for seven minutes. Oh god. Straight. Oh. But then I told a couple of funny. Uh, I, t- I told a couple of funny stories, and then I did a bit in Turkish and crushed. So I considered it a win. <laughs> All that matters is the thing. It's like, you know, what is it? Happy Gilmore or, or, or um, where it's like just th- as long as the last thing you say before you get off stage crushes, you're good. You exactly. Like, yeah. I oh always live. God. I always live by I live by that. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so brutal, though. But I swear, like storytelling. So I do stand up and storytelling. And I, I love doing storytelling. It's so, so wonderful. And it really like it's so much fun. And it also it's it's all, like why I was able to start doing you know 45 minute sets and that kind of thing because i was like mm-hmm. okay i have a couple stories so like i'll do my stand up and you know m- like these chunks of stuff and then i'll tell the story of the time i got mugged and i chased the guy down and i got my shit back yeah, yeah um and i'll talk about a bar fight i got into like and it's and in storytelling it's i think it's so fun because it's just real like no one's pulling anybody's leg nothing's like yeah, i just it's I don't know. it's very and and the storytelling community i es- especially feel is they're very there's a, l- a lot of latitude for sincerity that you don't get at, yeah. at comedy clubs, yeah. which I really enjoy. And this is the w- one bit of elitism I will hold over most of the storytelling community and that we can tell stories and there's punchlines. Like mm-hmm. there's a lot of like a lot of laughs instead of whereas I think some sometimes there's a big emotional payoff at the end, which sometimes I, l- I love that. But mm-hmm. That's my one little bit of, ar- yeah. <laughs> of thing arrogance I've been able to let go of yet, but no, I hear you. And I mean, it's for the emotional stuff. It's got to be right place, right time, you know. And Correct. and I do sometimes I'll get annoyed I- in the storytelling community if they seem to almost resent that there are punchlines within a story because it's like, hey, listen, it's okay. This uh-huh. doesn't need to be walking through the desert. I'm allowed to have beats that are you know yeah. strong and get a reaction, you know, like totally. Um, but I do, I do love that in storytelling, like. You know, and uh, whenever I've hosted shows where there are storytellers, I always tell the audience, I'm like, this, it might be funny, it might not. It might be sad, it might be just compelling. Like, you never know where you're going. And uh-huh. it's just so, uh, I, I just so th- I think it's so neat to hear about people's lives and their experiences and, yeah. you know, I, oh I love yeah. it. Oh, yeah, abs- absolutely. Like, that's why I love podcasting, because you get to know more about people from, yeah. like, uh, just than from their jokes. Mm-hmm. Like, um, wh- a bunch of, a while ago, I had when I had Maria Heineck on, I only knew her from her stage persona, and that she, I guess I thought she was kind of mean. <laughs> but, mm. like, but when she s- came over and, went and, oh, and so sat sweet. down, it was a really nice conversation. Like, yeah. we talked about her time in, s- her time in Spain, and I, I spent some time in Spain, and, like, her brother. Yeah. Uh, it's some, like really compelling stuff that it's hard to get to when you're trying to go in for, for chuckles. I know, totally. And, and chuckles I mean and justifying the $9 a <laughs> beer or two drink minimum. <laughs> I know, exactly. And, and I mean, in comedy, we all know each other sort of in a shallow way at first, you know, like, because you're just seeing people at mics and at shows and, uh-huh. like, you're just seeing their set. Like, you know, it takes a while to kind of drill down and know, like, oh, such and such you know, volunteers here or such and such lost their mom this summer, you know, like just to really know. Uh, but uh, but that's one thing I love about the stand-up community is like, uh-huh. you know, you do get to know each other usually over time. And over like, time, you yeah. Know. Yeah, there's this sort of like, I, I think that we know each other very deeply in a very shallow way. Mm. Like we, because we know each other from our, our bits and from jokes and at, and at shows. But then you also know some very personal stuff from the bits. And yeah. You're like, oh, I I think there's more to this per yeah. more to this person. And especially when you learn that, like, oh, that's true. You know, like n- somebody didn't say they were raped for this joke. Like that's true. Right. Know? Yeah. Which is always I, y- yeah. I I I know there's there's some comedians that'll that'll there's a certain latitude with to get to the punchline or even like certain jokes I've I've learned about. Like, uh, this is not gonna make me sound cool, but Dane Cook had. <laughs> Uh, has this joke about responding to a guy who sent him a, a really nasty email, but his response in the joke isn't how he actually responded. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh. Whereas I think I kind of want to know, I, I kind of 
would want to hear like how he actually responded and how it and exactly how it yeah that's why like I mean Katie Kampa bust my chops because I always am like I don't enjoy fiction like I think fiction is bullshit. I like truth and I like reality, you know, and I think it would actually be more compelling to hear about like, okay, Dane Cook, it would probably be cool for you to say, I lashed out at this guy, but you didn't. Let's talk about why you didn't. And that's actually pretty interesting. Like, yeah. are you fearful of alienating a fan? Are you fearful of seeming like a diva? That's interesting to drill into, you know? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like that, that like so much, like so much more depth can be, can be mined from that. Yeah. I think, and, and I think I'm s- the same way. If I want fiction, I'll read a book. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and I won't. Like, I don't enjoy fiction. You know? <laughs> 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 but you know what I mean? Like, and yeah, yeah. although I will say I do love um, Edith Wharton, and I, you know, like, I do read some books that are fiction, but I don't know, for the most part, like, I like documentaries. I like uh-huh. real things. I mean, and granted, and I can, I can dig fiction if it's, like, historical fiction or if it's, like, grounded in, like, okay, two humans who have skin on their bodies or, you know, like... Yeah. I, where I just don't care at all is fantasy stuff. Like, I just, I mean, once in a blue moon, like, I read The Giver in, in middle school, mm-hmm. and I thought that was actually pretty cool, but... Yeah. I don't, like... It's all good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, rem- I remember the, the, I remember the, the Giver. Um, I won't tell you what grade I was in when I read it. Um, <laughs> I know, I was always in very high-level English classes, but, or, like, Handmaid's Tale, I mean, sometimes I'll dig into that kind of stuff and I'm like okay I can get on board with it but like I generally don't I have no interest in you know um, Game of Thrones or these things neither do I the only like fantasy stuff in in like the classic sense like I I thought Lord of the Rings was okay Uh, I didn't love it the way some people love it Um, I lean more Star Wars Um, Mm. but Mm -hmm. but like uh, if something like catches my imagination like the characters are compelling if there's something I can like compare myself to I'm I'm maybe more Mm -hmm. in, in inclined speaking of documentaries have you seen much of like warner herzog's documentaries i have not he has this amazing documentary called into the abyss it follows a guy who's on death row in texas who and they cut between interviews they conducted with him behind glass like oh you're on you're on death row uh, you're gonna you're gonna die and then like his family and like the victim's family and they tell the whole story they talk wow. to the community fascinating stuff yeah. and the other thing i remember from that is that they talked to the guy whose job was to flip the <sighs> the switch on the lethal injection drugs Whoa. and how it started to affect him after a while and how he kind of did it. and he said this very compelling thing whereas your life is the dash in between the two years your birth year and your death year on a gravestone that you're just living your dash Wow. And that has really stuck with me for like 10 years. Wow, you're just living your dash. That's fascinating. That reminds me of this quote that my high school director used to say, and maybe this is sort of a aside, but like he used to say, the measure of your life is your life. Uh-huh. You know, and I just love that of like, the measure of your life isn't how many kids did you have, how many things did you have? Like, yeah. the measure of your life is your life. Yeah, you know, like, Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know. I, I I was like thinking that way about like when people talk about their legacy, especially women, w- if you know having children and whatnot. Like I've always mm-hmm. known I don't yeah. want to have kids, and I'm like, yeah, you know, I think there's so many ways to have a legacy, and some of them are through jokes, some of them are through treating people well, some yeah. are through you know like just being who you are. But um, I got to check out that documentary. That sounds amazing. Oh, I think you'd be really yeah. interested in it. And if you like that, he's done a couple of other similar documentaries with death row inmates. It's Fasc- it's yeah. fascinating. It's yeah. fascinating stuff. Um, it's talking about like legacy. You like it in the same way. I think about this a lot. Like just the l- my like uh, uh, the m- most important part. I think of, of a person's legacy now is what are the your p- people's memories of you? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Like like there there are certain prominent like f- figures that I think no one is going to be like compelled to mourn when when they die Mm -hmm. or when they pass or there's whereas i hope that you know you know maybe maybe i wasn't the most famous comedian maybe i wasn't the funniest comedian but gosh nobody has a really bad story about how i made them uncomfortable at a show exactly exactly i mean and there's a line from an indigo girls song that says like if we ever leave a legacy it's that we loved each other well you know like just yeah, like I hope that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, oh, and I mean Indigo Girls, oh, their lyrics are so great. But 
But yeah, I mean, and I think, I know over the summer, a friend of mine from childhood and high school died very suddenly, very, uh, you know, shockingly and tragically. Um, and it, it made me reflect on my memories of Jenny and just that, like, yeah. it was always so positive and, you know, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, you would hope that. And I was like, I mean, what a blessing of uh, just that, like, she was such a wonderful person. I mean, so tragic and, like, for her kids, like, it's so sad. But, you know, I mean, yeah, like, it... it uh, this past weekend, I was hanging out with some friends from high school, and we were all reminiscing about Jenny. And yeah, yeah. It was really sweet. We were, like, sitting at a bar just, like, crying and getting drunk and just uh-huh. remembering, like, our favorite driving around and high school shit and going, getting beers, going to parties. And it was just lovely to have just nothing but good memories, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, That's yeah, I would hope exactly that it's, like, I would hope that no one would ever be like, oh, Selena always cut in line at the open mics or whatever. You know, I, I'd be like, <laughs> no, Selena had a funny joke about a cop or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that was what I was going to say earlier, talking about, say, I probably at least once a week say, my fuck cups oh and then I just God. laugh oh my to God. myself at my desk <laughs> literally oh I'm so glad I that story I love so much because over the su- this past summer I recorded an album yes called seen, seen better days. days I was listening to it earlier today. Oh, yay I hope you enjoyed it I, I think you did a great job it's very well put together was that where was that recorded at the duplex upstairs in Ooh. like their d- in their room up there which is a great place to record an album nice or to make a tape or anything I was Fantastic. going I was going to record at Union Hall and then they had a fire like I remember that yeah, yeah I yeah. felt like the whole album was like this weird like comedy of errors and I was like what is going on um so it was weird because I was preparing to record it in April and then, and I booked a ton of work to be ready. Yeah. And then that fire. So then I had to kind of take my foot off the gas. But then I booked it July. It was when I recorded it. Mm-hmm. But you know, after after that, I was like, okay, I'm tired of all my jokes. And and that cup story was sort of evolving and unfolding. And so then when it all like wrapped up and I got the cups back, <laughs> spoiler alert. Um, I, I you know I was like, okay, here we go. I'm so tired of all my material. I got some new stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my favorite line for that one is so bad. It's 9/11. Never forget my cops. <laughs> <laughs> it's like so offensive, <laughs> so offensive. Oh my god, <laughs> god. Yeah, New York audiences always love that one. Anywhere else, they're always like, oh no, you know. And I'm like, <laughs> give yeah. me a break. It's like they're not offended. You don't have exactly. to. Exactly. Yeah. Oh god. Yeah, I I, lo- I love saying that. I love saying that to audiences. Like I I. When I was doing some, I, I can't remember what show, insert whatever joke I was doing, and I was, and I was like, are you, are you upset that I said it or that it happened? <laughs> exactly. I just said it. Exactly. I like that Seth Meyers does that on his monologue sometimes. He'll like, him and Colbert have started doing that. Like if the audience groans, they'll just be like, well, they actually did it. I just reminded you of it. Yes. Like, yeah. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. Let's examine what we're reacting to. Here. Yeah. I'm not the bad guy. You know, I mean, but there are certain words that like just an audience immediately will freak out, you know, or freeze yes. up or won't even listen to you. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I am a firm believer that everything can be made fun of. Everything can be fought or everything, you know. And but like, you know, I found that. Because I didn't use, I used to think like I, I just couldn't handle rape jokes. I just, mm-hmm. for me, because of my experiences, I was like, this is my, that's my, ta- like, ah, nah, I can't, you know? Yeah. Um, but then I would think about it and I was like, you know, I mean, for some people, they lost grandparents in the Holocaust. For some people, that's their one that they can't handle. And some people, 9 11. And who's to say, yeah. Like, uh, I think that it, everything should be allowed, but you gotta be smart. Like, you've gotta be imaginative and, Ex- you know, and like, don't re-victimize the victims. Change the power structure of it. You know what I mean? Like, you've got to be smart. The problem with a lot of really, like, contentious topics is often dumb comedians will try and talk about them. And it's like, you're dumb. You're not doing this well. You're dumb. Because right. you're re-victimizing the victims. Exactly. You're, you're, you're tackling it the wrong way. Exactly. And it's not yeah. censorship. It's just craft. Yeah. You're We're talking about craft here. Exactly. You're just it's floundering, and this isn't going well. But I have found that, like... You can have, you know, no matter what, you've got to know that the audience might just hear the word rape or might just hear the word 9-11 and freeze up. And, like, exactly. they're not going to listen. Yeah, and just be a- aware of that as, as a mm-hmm. fact. But I, th- I think, especially if you're tackling, tackling really specific topics where people have very set feelings and, and opinions on, as long as you know what you're thinking and, and what you're saying, then you're, bu- then you're bulletproof. Mm-hmm. As long as you know where you're coming from, then they can get offended and you can just make them look, you can just make them look ridiculous yeah. for, for how they're, what they're getting mad at. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I like. I, I don't like making rules in, co- in, in comedy, but I think every comedian should be able to, should have a couple years of 
doing observational humor before you try to be Patrice or Bill Burr. <laughs> like, yeah. I love, uh, like, Patrice makes me laugh. Bill Burr has made me just cry laughing when yeah. I saw him at Madison Square Garden. But I think you should be able to talk about yourself or the world around you before you just, before you're going to tackle this other stuff. Because you're, you're not going to do it well the first time. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to play into that whole whole thing and you're too new to understand yeah exactly i mean you have to know the rules to break the rules you know and like yes so and i mean they always say that in improv like i used to do improv before i got into stand-up and it was like uh -huh. you know people would be like well i, I went to a herald night this week and I, I saw that they weren't even doing and the teachers would always be like you have you have to be trained in the thing and know all the rules and then you're allowed to kind of go off but like you need to initially learn the structure and then you know and uh, and I do, yeah, like, I agree with that. I also think it's important, you know, uh, no one can steal your comedy if it is self-referential or if it's stuff that happened to you or, you know, like. Yes. And I do think it's important to, uh, as maybe this seems hack, but, like, you kind of are, you have to give the audience an on-ramp to you and you have to sort of introduce yourself to them. So, yeah. you know, like, for as lame as it feels like to be like, oh, comment on what you look like or, or their assumptions about you. Sometimes that is so useful, and especially w early in comedy, that's so important. Even in crystallizing your identity, your voice, like mm -hmm. their assumptions about you, um, just introducing yourself. You know, even like I'm from Boston, ba ba ba. Here's the deal. You know, like I joke, I'm like I got a, I dated a million guys, or you know, growing uh -huh. up in Boston, like you just dated a million guys named Kevin. You know, yeah. Um, your your joke about how uh, your your name, even like Selena, is not your uh, a white girl name. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, you know, just to because then also the audience remembers. Oh, her name's Selena. Like audiences never. remember remember anyone's name you know like all yeah i mean because also you know the intro they're hearing is like she's been on uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, you know like you're i mean i'm not surprised audiences never remember a name but yeah i think it's if you want the audience to like maybe follow you on twitter or follow up with you it's good to have yeah maybe a joke about your name or yeah or yeah about expectation I, I, ex exactly like Gabriel Iglesias, people wouldn't remember his name, but people remembered Fluffy. Yes, yeah, exactly. A and yeah. now if you Google Fluffy, Gabriel Iglesias comes up and yes. he tours the world. Yeah, and exactly. And I think, I, think I think that's so cool. The fact that I started to really appreci appreciate him in the last couple of years just for what he does. Because if you look at, if, you, m if most comedy nerds would look at his act and think it's kind of uh, broad, mm -hmm. but it's specific to him. It's his life and his experiences. It's amusing storytelling and funny noises are eternally I always going to be funny. Yeah. And the fact that he's doing this stuff and relating to people, he can relate to people in California, relates to people in New York, mm -hmm. relates to people in Turkey, relates to people in Saudi Arabia. Wow. Do you know that story of his? No. He pr he got a request. It's on, I think it's on his third album that he did in Hawaii. He got a, re a request to perform for a prince in Saudi Arabia, mm. and they set up this big show in kind of a remote location because, you know, secret police, you can't really have comedy in yeah, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah. Um, and an all-male show, I'm sure, right? Cause they no, there were women there, too. Really? Yeah. He, wow. I, I, Mr. Iglesias, if this ever gets back to you, I, I quote your jokes out of respect, sir. Um, <laughs> but he, he, he was doing crowd work with a woman in a burqa, and he was like, oh, I saw your ankle. And she's like, oh, you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> oh, my God, that's great. <laughs> and everyone was just having a, a, great, a great time. Yeah, and, and that's neat. Yeah, he also says that's the first time someone called him American. Oh, wow, that's funny. Like, just that he, everyone assumed that he's Mexican. Yeah, or, everyone know? assumes he's Mexican. Or, and or even in America, they're like, almost as though he's not. Of, yeah, you know? like he's born, he's from California, mm -hmm. but yeah. they'll just call you call you Mexican. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow, that's fascinating. Also, that goes back stuff. to an earlier um, sort of conversation we were having about finding your voice and how, like, I feel like when I was young, you know, everyone's like, find your voice, find your voice. And I was sort of like, oh, okay. And... You know, it, it took me year. I th I think my evolution was very slow, and it took me a long, long time. But yeah, you so y uh, t just to kind of t talk about your evolution a little bit. So you start in Boston mm -hmm. in '05. You're there for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. You then move to New York. Yes, move to New York. Um, not hitting it hard right away. Just mm -hmm. sort of like getting settled. '08. I start running a show at Luca Lounge with Julia Rossi and my friend Heidi Edsel. Mm -hmm. It's a weekly show. Um, and Luca Lounge is a dump. I think uh, it ended up being d um, closed by the Department of Health. It literally <laughs> would rain through the ceiling. Wow. Like it was so bad. Oh my God. But running a weekly show, I mean, 
it got me hustling, writing a lot more, yeah. p- reaching out to time out in New York, like meeting a lot more comedians because I was booking more, you know, like yeah, that absolutely. was when then I started sort of hitting it. And then, and Leah Doobie, my good friend who's a comedian in LA, she often mm-hmm. says to me like, and that was when comics, the comedy club was around. Yep, I remember that. Club. Yeah, and they had like, you know, the basement shows at Ochi's Lounge, which was so fun. Yep. Cambry Cruises, like yeah. wonderful den. Um, and that was when I finally sort of found my voice and... And, like, you just have to accept what it is. Like, I think I I was sort of self-conscious because I was like, oh, I'm very, like, high energy and kind of crazy on stage. And I kind of wanted to pull that in because I found it sort uh-huh. of embarrassing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it j- it just but after enough time, I was like, no, this is what works for me. This is what comes naturally to me. I can't pretend to be anything else. And I'm not good at other formats of comedy. I'm not deadpan. I'm yeah. not slow. Like, I am very high energy and I know for a lot of people it's a real like whew, shock to the system yeah, yeah um but it's just what works for me you know and and uh, and that I think is such a wonderful thing to learn of like just sort of finding your voice and then surrendering to it and just knowing like yeah yeah I know I'm not for everybody and and I, I'm great friends with some comedians where I don't enjoy their stand-up uh-huh. but they are for some people you know like it's yeah. just, you know like everyone it, and it's all good Ex- exactly and then if you get with those people that's how you create a well-rounded show because mm-hmm. if you had seven of the of the same kind of comedian that would get really old exactly i mean that's why and you don't see it as much anymore but you know back when i would see a lineup of straight white guy straight white guy straight mm-hmm. white guy i was like i mean it, just for the sake of a diversity of topics they might talk about, you got to break this up, you know, like, yes, because straight white guys, if they're talking about dating, this might end up being sort of the same, or at least it's always going to be about, uh, you know, a heterosexual dating. Like, yes, I mean, I run a quarterly show called Bitchcraft with Lauren Mall. Mm-hmm. Um, that's at Sid Gold's request room. It's so much fun. And it's stand up storytelling music um, and some characters. And we're super mindful of like, just having a diversity of ages, of races, of sexual orientation, like yeah. of ability, because, it, like I, I mean, I want everyone in my audience to feel like, oh, well, that's that's like me, you know? Like, exactly, and like talking about representation is talked about a lot because there is there's something to, like, again, if the audience is going to judge you right when they look at you, look at you, that's your that's like again, it's a first a first thing of like, oh, okay, uh, this is, I could probably relate to this person. They mm-hmm. remind me of, of me. And, and yeah, just, and again, a diversity of, of, of viewpoints. Cause even if we're, if it's a night where a lot of people are talking about kind of similar stuff or topical stuff, you're going to, you want different takes on that. You want exactly, different, yeah. you want a different uh, perspective. Cause the way I think is different from how they're going to think. Exactly. I mean, and it's as simple as like, I mean, do you ever go to a restaurant and you're like, Hey, for an appetizer, I want mashed potatoes for a drink. I want mashed potatoes for an entree. I want mashed potatoes. Like, no, you want to have different things going on, you know, like exactly. It's just interesting and exciting. And, and I know like, I mean, as a woman, it's uh, like, I've definitely, uh, it's weird because, you know, we socialize women who go to comedy clubs to, you know, the, it's mostly guys are going to be performing and you're going to do the mental gymnastics to, mm-hmm. you know, enjoy this joke about yanking on a dick and you don't have a dick, you know, like, right. and we ne- almost never do the reverse. And I've walked on stage so many times and it was when I was younger and mm-hmm. actually like when I really couldn't handle it mentally, which is not always the way, but, mm-hmm. you know, and I'll just see guys crossing their arms and they just assume I'm going to be terrible. And, uh, right. you know, you. I mean, I always say like, you got to work twice as hard or no, Kathy Griffin says <laughs> you got to work twice as hard to get half the laughs. Like. Uh-huh. You started a deficit, and it's just it's just a lot more work. But like you know, when you do get them, it's really nice. And you would hope that it's like, yeah, I'm gonna talk about stuff that you can also relate to, and I have a unique take. And yeah. is anyone here from Boston? Cool, we're gonna relate, even if you're someone who looks nothing like me. But you know, uh-huh. like it's yeah, you should want that. Yeah, representation. Yeah, and I just I love being able to. I love when I can go up and just kill kill in a black room or if mm-hmm. i can just go up and kill yes. in a Lat- latino room if i can because i never feel like i can relate to anybody o- other than just most people <laughs> i feel like i'm pretending to be a normal person in most of my office jobs <laughs> i feel like i'm pretending to be a normal person like ordering a sandwich <laughs> um but to and especially if you're doing personal stuff you're g- like oh i I'm not alone. The laugh makes me feel like I'm not alone. Yeah. And their laugh, maybe they don't feel alone. Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And they know, you know, like I have this silly joke on my album about going to bed and breakfast. And, you know, a lot of people are like, yeah, I go to a bed and breakfast and I'm like, what is this nightmare? Like, even (laughs) if it's like relating to someone on something as silly as a B and B, but like, 
that's, you know, really fun to be like, okay, yeah, I can relate to this and I'm not alone, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Isn't that's that what comedy is, you that's know? That's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like I'm helping, like w- like th- we're help- like you want the audience to feel good, but I'm I'm making myself feel good too. Yeah, I totally. Through just through telling the story, or like w- Mike, I've been I haven't done in a while, but I have this one man show that's like all of like my long form stories, and it's oh, like that's great. and it's like a lot of stuff about my dad. It figures it you learn a lot of why I am the way I am, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I love when people come like my favorite reactions are laughs or. <gasps> Mm-hmm. When I oh, when I yeah. reveal some when I reveal something yeah. kind of in oh there's intense. nothing better in storytelling there's nothing better than the gasp you know yeah. oh, like I love the gasp oh it's so <laughs> wonderful you know like and I mean I only have a few stories where they're structured so that it is like you know but oh I mean I took storytelling with Margot Lightman at UCB years ago and mm-hmm. you know we would talk about all these like the gasp or like you know giving the audience an on ramp to like your story and. It, there's just the oh yeah, there's these wonderful moments that you can have, and when you do, it's just so one. It's just really precious. Yeah, I, because ag- again, there's just that there's that connection. I love stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, uh, I'm curious. First off, um, because uh, this has been this has been amazing. This has just kind of flown by. I've been loving this. Yeah, uh, this I know it's been a great conversation. Yeah, because to because like to to me, you're like when I think of like the great comics in New York, it, I'm like oh, I'm just a um, I was I was so glad that you did my show, and then I'm like just so it's glad so that you that you are that you talk that you're talking to me now. Um, you mentioned that you might you hated yourself for a little. How are you doing with that? Because I I have that I've had that at times too, and uh, I'm <laughs> curious uh, what's like. I I know you. What's uh, uh, are is there another album coming out? What are what are some other creative things you're you're lo- you're aspiring? Yes. Well, first question, hating oneself. Um, I, I mean, I'm gener- like, I think it's funny because I think everyone's always like, you're so upbeat. You're always so positive. And I am, you know, I mean, that's very I much. I think so. Yeah, that's very much how I am. And it's how my sisters are. You know, I mean, it's just sort of how we are. Um, mm. But I do think that, uh, you know, like uh, a lot of, I, I think that, you know, I, everyone battles dark times. And, yeah. um, and I know, I feel like I, and this is pretty can- more candid than I thought I would get, but like, I think I, uh, mine is based in like romantic stuff. Just a feeling that like yeah. romance and relationships are a language that I don't speak mm-hmm. and everyone else gets to have love and somehow I don't. Um, so I do struggle with feelings of uh, like that I don't deserve mm-hmm. things. And I find that really hard. And I think in dating, I tend to shoot myself in the foot because uh-huh. I think that I like. Li- I think that I kind of set myself up for failure because I think somehow deep down, I think mm-hmm. no one will ever love me. Uh, romantic love will never happen for me. Um, so that's like I've always felt like socially, I'm I can get along with anybody. I'm uh, I'm very social, but r- the romantic stuff has always sort of um, yeah been uh, a weird thing for me and I, I think there like is a little bit of like maybe body dysmorphia behind it because um, I growing up I was very I was very ugly and I was very like teased for being ugly and very self-conscious about how I looked and then I felt like I got older and I got a little prettier and I just and, and I just like I don't believe it and um, yeah, yeah. and like when I was younger guys would ask me out as a joke and it would be like a setup and that oh. happened to me numerous times so that like I'm very suspicious. I think of men who are interested in me. Uh-huh. Um, I'm very defensive. I think about that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, whew, anyway, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, that that's <laughs> not on unu- That's not unusual. I, yeah. I I don't think. I think uh, a- again, coming from what we were talking about earlier, you know, you get kicked around a lot. You you know the tropes. You know the 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 things. Yeah. Um, I I definitely have for several women been the first like not asshole that they've been with, and always and and have been approached with some suspicion initially mm, so yeah that's i feel that's not as uncommon as as you think it is um one of my fa- favorite greg barrett lines is uh you'll uh you'll probably hit the point where you when you don't need anyone and then someone will come along and fuck that up with their love <laughs> uh is a, a line from that's one of his great. his specials <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i've definitely um, like i feel like i've sort of like, because i don't want kids i'm like uh-huh. I'm I'm happy with my life. I'm not in a rush. I don't need to, you know. So yeah, there's um, no there's no clock beating you over the head. Yeah, exactly. But but I do, you know. I mean, but I am very. I read a lot of Pima Chodron books, and I try to be very aware when I'll fall into these old thought patterns. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, and it's like, 
you know, I my my mantra everywhere is like just be gentle with your sweet self, you know, like yeah, and and I think that's so important is like when you're going in a dark place or when you're like ah, no one will ever love me, just to be like, hold up, step back, be gentle, you know, like don't be so severe, don't be so black and white about what might happen, you know, just like mm-hmm. take it easy, be be a buddy to you, you know, yeah, um, but I mean generally, you know, things are good. But as far as future stuff, um, yeah, I, I love talking about stuff like this because, like, I have, like, whenever, like, I know people who put out albums, I'm like, I'm like, oh, I should have one, I, sh- I should have uh, one out by now, and like, I have like a, this and like my sh- so many things. So I'm always curious, like, what people are doing. Yeah, well, I was so psyched to do an album, and I really felt like I should have done it sooner. Like, mm-hmm. but I'm, uh, I'm just, I'm, I was never really someone who like set goals really, m- like. I was always just like, I don't know, I'm just excited to be here, you know, and, uh-huh. um, but then in the past few years, I started finally setting, you know, New Year's resolutions and goals, and that's been really great and helpful. Yeah. Um, but uh, I probably won't be doing another album for a while. Like, I was just so proud of this one, and this one was such a long time coming, um, but I have, do you, wh- do you follow NYT Vows? It's a Twitter and an Instagram I don't know. Okay, it's it's such a random thing, but it's I write it and it's a Twitter account, but then I also put it on Insta and I pretend to be the New York Times wedding section, um, <laughs> which I'm like obsessed with, and uh-huh. I've been obsessed with since I was like 12, which is uh-huh. sort of strange. But um, so it's just me making, and I just tweet or Instagram all the time. Like today, I had uh-huh. a pretty hot take uh, about the surf lodge in Montauk. Um, it's just me like name dropping country clubs, name dropping Hamptons shit. Cause <laughs> yeah. like I, my mom's family is kind of in that, uh, and bless them. I love them. Um, making fun of the wedding industrial complex, making fun of the times. Like it's just sort of all over. Yeah. Um, so that I love, and I, I have a new literary agent through that. So we've talked about, um, we've talked to a few publishers about making that into a small book or something. That um, would be, that would be great. I, I could, think, I yeah. could see that like, um, at Barnes and Noble, like exactly, that would be a good yeah. humor section. Yeah, and as a gift at like, if you go to a destination wedding and you get a little bag in the hotel room, like you know, just to, like the gray lady, like her hot takes uh-huh. on, you know, like, um, and it's really fun because I write, I you know, I, I am the fake gray lady, and yeah. I write in this really snobby way. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. I have a bunch of fun shows coming up this summer, and then also I write recaps of The Bachelor and The Bachelorette on my blog, uh-huh. um, which is how I got my first book deal, which is like so random. Uh, and my first nice. book was just a collection of essays about being blonde. It was uh-huh. very fluffy. Um, but but so it's this weird thing where, like, The Bachelor, like, I just started writing them on my blog years ago. And now, like, I can't get out. It's like the mafia. Like, everyone's always like, can't wait for your hot takes on the next season. And I'm like, ha, ha, ha. Uh-huh. Like, every Monday, it's like two to three hours, you know? But yeah. Um, but we're I'm hosting a kickoff show and a watch party at QED Memorial Day weekend that Monday. Um, Excellent. Yeah, which will be so fun. Oh, awesome. Well, that's this weekend, so I will edit this and get it up before the weekend, so maybe we can get some eyes on that. Okay, yeah, and I mean, no, no pressure. If I was planning to anyway, okay, awesome. I was planning to anyway. I've been trying real hard to get stuff up uh, once a week since I got my new space set up. So that's great. This is, Selena. This has been. I know wa- this has wonderful. been so fun. This Thank you so much great. for having me. Thank you so much for doing this, and uh, be gentle, listener. Yeah. Be gentle. Yeah. <laughs> great conversation thank you guys so much for uh for sharing that with me if you enjoyed the show please feel free to rate and subscribe on itunes and stitcher uh tell a friend it really helps me out and i appreciate you guys for listening get selena's album on itunes i'll have the link in the description um next week mc lars is going to be on the show i'm really excited to share that with you guys i've been a fan of his for a really long time and it was great to sit down and talk with him so Please uh, tell your friends, and thank you guys for listening, and I will see you next week between Awesome and Disaster. Take care, everybody.